Nicola Zerbergia. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay, so I'll, uh, before I really uh, start talking about the complexity of autonomous systems, as it is so early, maybe I first mention some of the simplicity. And then uh, we can uh, find a balance between this complexity and simplicity. Uh, finally, I will put you in the, our system perspective, namely rubber perspective, so that you can maybe better understand what I mean by complexity from another point of view. Uh, so um, I'll try to uh, follow this uh, path of the outline, like giving you a motivation for, for our work and approach, and uh, simply to uh, thinking about autonomous system to, to uh, somehow decompose it in the very little elements which should be simple uh, and then uh, make a composition again uh, which then uh, results in a fairly complex system. So I'll give you uh, the way uh, how we, I'll explain you the way how we uh, uh, want to do it. And finally, just that you don't think I'm just talking about uh, the scientific results, I'll give you some very uh, concrete, uh, practical uh, application. Uh, I'll go very fast over immobility and then focus a bit more on swarm robotics. And then basically, uh, actually this is what I would really like to, uh, uh, like to talk, but I'm afraid already that I will not have time for this. But I'll try to mention a bit more about impact impact of this technology that it may have on us because yesterday we heard uh, fabulous uh, uh, talks about privacy and how to protect it. We also heard something about uh, augmented reality. Uh, actually didn't hear much about the possible impacts. Uh, uh, I'm especially interested in the negative impacts as we all talk about positive impacts as technology providers. They are uh, almost neglecting the negative ones. So I'll try to, if I uh, found some time, I'll try to some, uh, just to point out uh, some of the uh, possible consideration of the technology impacts and maybe then uh, let you contact me later in future and we can do something together on this. Okay, so <laughs> I adore a uh, uh, longer uh, um, text on the slides, so I'll just make it much shorter for you. Uh, putting some keywords here. So uh, we talk about uh, highly dynamic uh, environments where physical and social con uh, contexts are, are always changing and we want to develop the system that control these kind of environments. So we based our approach on the knowledge and we want our system to be self-aware and adaptive. And that's how we derive autonomous uh, behavior. And uh, we have a, a specific approach to do this uh, and uh, then I'll uh, give you also some uh, examples on the real application uh, which were actually used to, to uh, make this technology and it will be uh, Swarm Robotics, Cloud Computing and E-Mobility. Uh, and at the end I'll somehow try to consider the natural versus artificial autonomy. Uh, in order to, to uh, contemplate on, on practices and impacts uh, of this technology. Because uh, mostly we can talk about science, but impacts comes from the practice. And practice usually goes beyond our wishes when it uh, comes to the companies, to the business models and so on. And uh, those are always a little bit of uh, tricky th uh, things. So it's not a time giving you my uh, personal approach. I'm giving you results from the huge uh, group of people working together for the last four years. Uh, uh, we are uh, grouped around the Athens project, and this is our flyer where you can see the, all the all the partners and major uh, ideas. But I, I just want to mention this and acknowledge the the work of the other colleagues of mine that uh, somehow we came together to do this. So most, uh, uh, mostly we are motivated uh, with the ideas uh, or with the wish to, to develop uh, uh, a sound technology uh, to solve the complex problems. Because nowadays we deal with uh, distributed systems everywhere. They are highly uh, 
uh, they are very uh, th they contain massive number of elements they are highly uh, they expected to to uh, to behave highly autonomous and uh, they usually have uh, uh, some kind of a local and global autonomy which are usually uh, in the contradiction so you have to harmonize this so the solution is to have a kind of a harmonization we also are in trouble with energy nowadays in the world and we have to make our system energy aware and those things are around uh, for a long, longer time but still uh, we are missing the, the proper technology for this and we can do it if we make our system components self-aware and the one aspect of awareness should be energy as well uh, and also we uh, expect that our system will uh, somehow work in unknown environments so how to deal with this uh, and those are all the things that motivate us, which actually are also grand challenge in software engineering. How to organize these kind of systems, and even more importantly, how to reason about them. Because it's, you know, when you have a, a adaptation or adaptive system or autonomous system, and if it is a, a nicely a designed system, it will work seamlessly. But how do you know whether it works properly then? How do you know when it adapts, if it just adapts? So we need some kind of uh, mathematical tools to reason about this. Before we let the system run autonomously, we have to be sure that it really does what it's supposed to do. Uh, so uh, we actually started with applications, and we have a huge application. We have also uh, a strong industrial partners behind. Uh, big uh, uh, automobile industry partner, uh, a big uh, uh, cloud computing provider, and also uh, some of the providers of the Swarm Robotics. So we sit together and see what, what are the problems there. And then we, we develop our technology. So in Swarm Robotics we deal with many small and simple robots. Uh, coordination and cooperation is, is, is crucial there. We usually have uh, uh, simple robots with simple tasks, but then they come together and they do uh, more complicated things. It's in the nature, uh, you can see the same thing in the nature. So it looks fantastic, you know, when you see how, how the birds are flying or when you see how the ants are doing something. But it, doing this with technical systems without much intelligence, it's extremely difficult. So those are this kind of simplicity and complexity which I uh, just suppose in, in uh, and I will be doing this also later in, in this talk. Uh, also in cloud computing, uh, we mostly what we have is uh, a centralized systems. When you have a, a huge, huge company offering uh, a lot of computing resources and you can use it, but this is not really the essence of cloud computing. What we want is to have a number of smaller computers that come together and build together a stronger platform than that it can do uh, more uh, uh, difficult things. So, so we had this kind of uh, ad hoc grouping of, of, of uh, resources that would that would build uh, build the bigger computer because i think that one of the major principles that we have here is a decentralization and uh, paradoxically you see that internet the web is being centralized in the last 10 years it's becoming a huge central system and actually what we would like is to have it decentralized again so we, uh, uh, could you imagine now nowadays that if you just omit three major players, like you put away Facebook, Google, and I don't want to mention the others, and you are just putting down 90% of internet users, they wouldn't know what to do it on, inter in, on the internet. So that's, that's what I mean by becoming centralized. And uh, it, we, we, we want to have it really decoupled. And in e-mobility, it's a crucial problem with resources, and now the major companies are trying to, uh, to produce uh, um, electrical vehicles and the problem of course is energy and the problem of course is to how to to make a battery uh, somehow stand longer this is the major problem e vehicles idea are long for now more than 50 years but still we don't have this nowadays with all this uh, technology we're trying to offer some services that can somehow um, help uh, people even in the presence of restricted uh, battery uh, 
duration to, to, to use e-mobility, and I'll talk a bit about this as well. So when you see all these applications, you can see that they're they are completely different, really. I mean, they have nothing to do with each other, but they have really some same generic elements in there, which we were using when we uh, design our, our, our te technology, when we build our technology to solve this problem. So we have many single elements. We have, uh, they all have individual goals. We need the coordination of this to make uh, uh, or to achieve more global goals. Uh, we need kind of symbiotic grouping. You see who, who needs home and then they group together on ad hoc manner and then compute something. We need adaptation, optimization, and also we need a, a robust um, behavior. So what we did actually, we, we, uh, we uh, developed uh, first uh, of all the, the concept which is based on very simple elements which we call service components. And then uh, we build this, uh, uh, we build this uh, uh, bigger uh, elements which are called ensembles. Uh, and then we try to make them uh, really work autonomously. And it's all based on the awareness. Uh, awareness is a crucial, uh, uh, a cr a crucial element in our design because uh, we see awareness as a knowledge about some aspect of the system that we need. Uh, or, and then uh, basically uh, we provide the modeling tools that would provide formalism, uh, linguistic contracts, programming tools, featuring autonomous and adaptive behavior based on awareness. So we integrate functional, operational, and energy awareness to provide autonomous behavior with reduced uh, energy consumption. So we make a, a kind of a, a development life cycle for these kind of systems. And we have on this two major uh, uh, circles, maybe it's better to see the, the picture. We have two major uh, circles, and this is the, the proper design time circle. And we do, I mean, th those are also known uh, elements, but we just group them in uh, slightly differently. So we do requirement engineering, uh, modeling and programming, and verification and validation, which we found it very important, especially this verification and validation, because especially in unknown environments, you have to be sure in advance that you are doing things correctly. And then we deploy the system, and then we have a runtime, which is again very uh, important part. I mean, you still need to check your system. We have to do a lot of monitoring. We have to monitor awareness and adaptation process. We have to see that it's really working. Even if we do a formal verification, we do also a physical monitoring. And then sometimes you have to go back to do some redesign. And this is the manual part where you really go do redesign and uh, redeploy the system again. So uh, again, uh, this is from our project pl uh, flyer. And in order to, to support this uh, development life cycle, we developed a number of, uh, of tools. Uh, and here are uh, some of them that we developed within the project. And of course, I can't talk about all of them, but I'll mention some of them, which are, I picked some which are really, which follows this uh, uh, development uh, life cycle, and then uh, I will talk a little bit about this. So let's come to requirement analysis as, as a first phase. Uh, there, if, if we have to single out uh, the, the entities which we call service components and define their goals and uh, define how we will do grouping. We have to figure out what is the adaptation and awareness aspects that we uh, want to have, what are self-properties that we need. And uh, somehow you have to uh, select all this and then uh, uh, see how you can uh, uh, pr uh, make a system which respects all that. So now, uh, here on this big table, uh, you can see uh, the SWARM Robotics with its major requirements. You can see the e-mobility with its major requirements. I'll talk about this too, not about cloud computing. And then you see the common features which are actually on the left-hand side. So th those are the things that we want to extract on our requirement analysis phases, and then we develop the adaptation model, which we see, and this is interesting, that we see uh, the adaptation as a movement in this adaptation space. So each coordinate of our adaptation space, which is of course n-dimensional, uh, is an one aspect of awareness. 
So you find actually the knowledge which is uh, like a coordinating system of our adaptation space. And adaptation means moving from one place, one dot in the space to another, where you can of course have some pre and post conditions and some uh, the things that the uh, system had to fulfill when moving through this. And that would help us really reason about adaptation in a more formal way. But also it helps us to, to develop uh, some kind of adaptation patterns which are typical for systems so that you can reuse your, your patterns and program on a higher level uh, adaptive system. So uh, I'll just try to go a bit faster. Uh, so uh, you you can more formally describe the system in this way. Don't worry, I won't go in details uh, with this, but I just want to show you a bit of uh, uh, more formal description. And uh, mostly then you end up with a number of uh, patterns that you can use in your system and you can combine this pattern which helps you program the system. So uh, I'll just uh, show you a short pattern where you have a usual way, I mean you have a feedback loop and then you have uh, certain conditions, then you see whether you have sensors that get some new data, you have your plan what to do with this and then you, you change your status. So uh, those are the, the, the way how, how you can take one, one pattern and then uh, combine them to, to make a more adaptive behavior. Again, I'll try to skip all these formal things to make uh, somehow the, 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 the approach flow a bit faster. So modeling is done, as I mentioned, with service component and uh, ensembles of the components. And mostly, again, just a, bleak, uh, a little uh, uh, description of the formal aspect of this. Uh, service uh, component uh, is an element that has its interface, that has its uh, uh, behavior description, it has its policies description and the knowledge. Knowledge again crucial for awareness and the adaptation where you actually uh, describe, uh, you, you, you make your, your system aware of uh, its own functionality. So what is uh, original in this approach is that uh, we uh, create ensembles out of these little elements in a way that uh, some of the knowledge here uh, has to match some other knowledge and then those ensembles will be created. Or we said ensembles are formed according to the predicates over the attributes. That somehow means that ensembles are created dynamically. So uh, you can see it as a uh, very implicit communication. You see some examples later, but this is the most crucial things because only in the runtime you decide who will be with whom. So in the, in, in the, in the design time you don't know actually uh, how the ensembles will look like. When some conditions are fulfilled, then the components will build ensemble. In a way it's like in the nature, you know, like building symbiosis of the common interest. You have elements and they recognize each other, they see how they can use each other, they build an ensemble. And then they can reassemble. That's uh, how we make it a bit more artificial and and uh, in nature usually uh, symbiosis stays but uh, in our system it can go uh, come together and go again there is a mathematical algebra uh, behind that which helps us reason about this kind of system structuring so uh, we can prove certain uh, properties of the system using uh, this process algebra which is actually used to define the, the the um, uh, service components and uh, ensembles. Again, I will not go through this, but if anyone has interest, we can talk later about this. Uh, just to jump further on more practical issues, we're not staying on this process algebra level where you can, in your head, actually have all the proofs. And those uh, crazy colleagues of mine say, we don't need a program to run, we know it's correct. However, <laughs> we have a Java system that supports that. Uh, it's called the JRESP and it has a special uh, a notation uh, to match the, uh, the, the concept of the, of the uh, cell uh, algebra and uh, I'll show you later on uh, just pieces of code and indicate some interesting part. 
Uh, okay, then we have tools to, to uh, support runtime monitoring. As I mentioned, it is extremely important to monitor uh, the adaptation before you really let system uh, run and do uh, what, what it's supposed to do. So we have a framework uh, which observes this uh, Java programs, which follows the, the cell uh, the technology, and then we have a visualizer that somehow visualizes how is our ensemble building at the time. When the adaptation happened, we can see it, so that it helps engineer really observe this. This is not for the end user. This is really for, for those who develop the system to analyze it, to reason about this, and to see practically whether it works correctly. Uh, Okay, I'll just uh, think I'll just uh, focus on the picture. So uh, what you have, this is the previous picture of the JRASP environment, which supports uh, cell algebra. Now, uh, when, uh, uh, when we build this uh, monitor, mostly what we do is the following. Uh, if you have a monitor application uh, written in JRASP, then it already has as I mentioned, uh, cell processes, it has policies and knowledge. Knowledge is, is our ba basic part which actually reacts and makes the system uh, aware and adaptive. And then we have these attributes which are used to create dynamically the ensembles. So now our monitoring system takes these attributes and develops the new data structure from the running application so that it can somehow connect and see who is working with him and then illustrate this making some graphical presentation of ensembles and and whenever some changes happen here when the when the new ensembles are, are developed here they will be shown graphically when uh, they uh, de-ensemble then they will be deleted from there or you can even go and see some of the of the attributes or of the knowledge or aspect awareness uh, uh, values so that you can follow you can focus on certain things and then follow this and uh, when i uh, tell you a bit more about practical application then we can come back to see uh, what you can do with this okay so uh, let me now show you some of the results and again, I'll just try to go very fast over immobility. I just want to show it to you because it's, it's representative. It tells you that we are doing this on, 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 on parallel levels, not only for robotics, as I put a focus in, 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 this, call, in, in this talk, but also uh, on immobility, where immobility is a system which controls and organizes uh, um, transportation with electrical vehicles where you mostly uh, have uh, a few elements which we uh, somehow make as a, a service uh, components. And those are electrical vehicles, those are the user of the vehicles, and then we have some infrastructural elements like parking places and charging stations and the traffic information. Those are crucial things for the e-mobility. And of course, when you travel uh, with, with a car which, uh, with restricted uh, battery, uh, capabilities, you are, you are very much interested in, in parking and you are very much interested in uh, charging stations. Also, you need to know the traffic conditions because you don't, wo you, you don't want to go somewhere where the, the traffic jam is because you'll, if you run out of energy in the middle of, the, of, the, of, 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 of some queue, then you are lost. And also, what we introduced is a car sharing principle. And this is uh, one of, of the major contributions of our approach to e-mobility is that we see the transportation as a service. So you don't own the car, which is now the change of the philosophy. You own the transportation service, which means that someone else may take you to, to his car if your car cannot go further. And also you should be ready to take someone if they don't have, uh, if they are in trouble to coming to the, 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 their uh, destination with the car. And putting all this together, uh, uh, somehow close the transportation service, taking into account all of this, and really provides a very, very useful uh, way of how to, 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 um, to organize the transportation. I don't know whether you're aware of this, but I mean, uh, 
oh, most of the of the uh, electrical car pro uh, producers are now offering a number of services. This is the part. I don't want to to advertise the partner that's working with us. You can see it in Askins project who it is, but. There are some other car producers who would, let's say, offer you, when you go on the longer travel, they give you the, the normal car. And, and, and I mean different approaches, but uh, we, we have this approach where we uh, believe that uh, car sharing and uh, somehow stepping aside from this, I own everything what I use, but I, 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 I need a service, is, is a good principle, especially nowadays when most of the things are becoming services you know, with the internet, uh, with cloud computing, then it's very similar. You don't need to possess the, the big computer. You can use the cloud. Those are the positive aspects of this. They are also negative, but I now I skip them. Okay, so uh, then we go and uh, in a detail uh, decompose the problem. As I said, from the user perspective, of course, for the user, there's one thing in mind. I want to be there at this time. I don't care. And of course, how much you don't care, it's usually measured with the money. And that's how you can optimize, you know, uh, this. Because as I mentioned, uh, this optimization of the local and global uh, goals uh, is crucial in this kind of system. Because usually they are not really in harmony. Let's say, if two of us want to travel somewhere and there is one parking place, then we are in trouble. We know that we want to go there, but there is only one parking place in this destination, re relatively close to your destination. So you need somehow to, to negotiate. You need to harmonize. Whenever you have resources which, are, which can be exhausted, you need a, a kind of optimization and uh, harmonization. And in immobility, e there's a plenty of those situations and also in, in, in the many of the other systems. So we, we have to deal with these issues and we do it with, uh, uh, with techniques uh, here. Uh, and uh, again, uh, some other elements, even the, the simple uh, park place uh, has, uh, as a service component, has a number of, of elements to, to think about. Okay, then we program all of this. We first describe them. We do this requirement analysis. We make, we realize what kind of adaptation patterns we need to deal on the local level on this, and then we compose them in the bigger system. So, uh, as you see here, I'm going very fast through these slides, just to show you that we uh, carefully describe. Uh, all these elements uh, when we put them together and uh, also uh, traveling and uh, uh, deciding uh, what is the optimal route is not a trivial question especially when you have then the parking problem and you have to decide about this so we do it in iteration we do it uh, many times and we also use self uh, <coughs> self constraint logic programming to decide uh, especially when you have 10 cars I, I was talking about two cars but usually you have Ten, uh, tens or hundreds of cars competing for ten parking places, which makes things a little bit more complicated. And then you have to use this kind of technology to uh, somehow favor some or make some compromises and uh, to, uh, to decide uh, uh, how, how you do it. Now, just to show you, to indicate you the piece of code, I, I won't go into details, don't worry. But uh, this is the part of the code which indicates our ensemble building where we believe we, 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 we really got original is that uh, here you have a condition which is a predicate that you want a free parking place and you want that the walking distance from your point of interest to this parking place is less than certain, let's say, you don't want to walk more than uh, half a kilometer. And when you make this condition, then uh, the system searches for all the parking places that satisfies this condition and build ensemble of these parking places so that you can select one of those. And of course, if, if there are many uh, uh, drivers coming to the closer area, you will have a lot of, you, you will have ensembles for each partner, then you will have ensemble of these ensembles, and then it will let you somehow harmonize this. And this is the something which is known only in the runtime. 
uh, because the, the park place availability is, is something which is really time dependent, so you don't know in advance. So this is the example of our ensemble building uh, sentence. So this is the predicate and just when our monitoring system looks that here, it can really sketch uh, all these ensembles. Okay, so the, the other code would look like this, but again, I am not going to, to bother you with this. A more global picture of our e-mobility uh, simulation system is the following. You have, and of course, uh, it was one of the major problems we had there, is that we use the custom from our uh, car producer uh, custom software, which, and they're very sensitive, they don't want it to go anywhere, even not to us. So we have to make a, a kind of web service and make it from the, like uh, having a, bla a black box here, that's why the picture there <laughs> is black, and uh, just take some of the information they were willing to give us. Uh, because they, they have, uh, you know, they collect a lot of information and this is a proprietary system, so they don't want to show, uh, give it to us. But nevertheless, you, from their system, you get, let's say, five optimal routes from the, uh, uh, how uh, a car can go from A to B. And uh, then you can put this into our system and then uh, somehow do further allocation of the parking places of the charging stations, taking into account the, the traffic condition and so on, and then make the, uh, how the system should run. Because they don't have all this information. They have their own old system with the precious information on how to, uh, let's say, what is the optimal route from A to B. Uh, taking only the energy uh, consumption in 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 uh, in account, but they don't uh, take the real time traffic situation. They don't take the parking position, uh, the parking availability, and then we do all this in this this part of the system, and then we can simulate how it all goes. And we have a real world simulation with MatSim system, which can be easily. Uh, substituted with the real traffic condition, then you don't need simulation at all. So we are still on the simulation level, but we use it as if they were real, because, for example, the parking places, we have the real parking places in the system from, from Berlin. Uh, uh, we have the, the real uh, traffic, con traffic conditions, but some of the things are, are still calculated using the, the simulation. Okay, so the, the, this is uh, our simulation system. Again, you, d you get from their custom system, you get this kind of uh, energy routes for various vehicles. And then in our system, we illustrate with using Google Maps uh, how the car would approach. And this is the kind of point of interest with a number of uh, uh, available parking places. And uh, then you can see visually how the system functions. Okay, now I want to show you, uh, to tell you more about our robots. That's uh, wh when I started. So, the scenario that we are solving uh, with the, the Swarm Robotic is to, that we have a kind of a disaster, and then our li little robots have to find uh, the some kind of radiation source and to build a wall around it and to rescue some of the possible victims. So, this is our, our, our uh, uh, rescue scenario, and we did actually elements of this with our, with our robots. We didn't do the whole scenario, but we take all the elements of this as an inspiration. So one of the things uh, when I talk about complexity and, and the simplicity is simply the exploration. And when, y when you think, okay, I'm coming in this area and I want to find some source of information with all the senses that we have, it's a trivial task for us. But imagine a robot uh, not knowing where to go, not knowing what he's looking for, uh, not having our eyes uh, finding something like this. It's, com it's very, very complex. <laughs> uh, so uh, how the robots do is they, they just wander, explore the situation and uh, the, the, uh, the area. And when they are too far away, they just stop and play the landmark for the others to follow them. So if I come to, s to a new room as a robot, I would stop and then the other would follow, then I can go further because if I'm too far from the other robots, we don't communicate. <laughs> so it's, it's a fairly complex, uh, complex uh, algorithm to uh, basically explore to find, let's say, to find a victim. And this is how 
uh, we sketch uh, this uh, and again uh, in this uh, in this area uh, uh, if we have robots here they should go out and you know they can go here they can go here they can go there but they should come there so it, it takes time and it's not easy uh, and uh, I think now I'll here uh, of course first you do a simulation of this before you put your robots doing this you have to simulate this because it would be too expensive to experiment everything on on the uh, on terrain so mostly uh, there are a lot of simulation being done in robotics before you can really uh, take the robot doing this so those are some part of the, of the simulation when the when the robots are are becoming uh, r uh, green when they uh, when they are landmarks and uh, indicating uh, sorry now i don't know how to okay i can put it here So here is uh, just one of the simulation how how they behave really. So you see a lot of, you know, uh, stochastic movement, you know, uh, almost ridiculous from our point of view. But robots don't know. I mean, they they have to learn uh, how to go and how to follow each other. Okay, so there are now a number of them, but I I, I don't have uh, time for this now. I just want to show you uh, uh, how we build. Uh, ensembles out of this so we have uh, service components robots of three different types like foraging robots rescue robots and uh, firefighters rescue robots can carry and uh, uh, foraging robots you can just uh, move around so they are not the same type of robots as well and then you can uh, build an ensemble uh, saying uh, give me all the robots who are close to designated area and then uh, you you uh, select some of them, or you can say, "Give me only the foraging robots close to the designated area." Uh, and uh, sorry, uh, it seems that I put it here that can carry something. And then you add more conditions to this, and then you can uh, get a less uh, robots, and then you can give them certain assignments. So here is the how how they uh, we describe this behavior using cell formal uh, process algebra which can help us really then again reason about the robot's behavior and then here is the JRES program for this and then we can use uh, this as I mentioned to verify the robot behavior and, and validate uh, uh, you know sometimes some algorithms wouldn't work at all and uh, this system helps us really check before we let our, our robots uh, run, check uh, whether the, uh, how the system is functioning and whether it is possible to solve the problem. And then even you can use different strategies and then you can have different speed of the system. So uh, we offer a number of tools to, to, uh, to uh, before we deploy this in, in the real system to, to, make the, to analyze the system and to see how, how the system function. And then again, also, we offer a validation of the system so that uh, you know that deadlocks will never occur. You know that the system will eventually, in the given time, give you results. So you have this limbness uh, proper th properties that are crucial for, for real-time systems that you... Uh, sometimes it's not enough that you, you reach the, uh, the goal if you don't reach it in the, in the given time. It doesn't have to be seconds, but it has to be within a given time because for, for various physical systems there are certain uh, conditions that you need to, to do. And then you can also do a live validation. For example, we have... A this BIP method allows us to run before you run the system, to simulate the running and then uh, find you the optimal way. Here saying if you use this technology the system will diverge. Th this uh, algorithm, the, uh, like a single robot with straight walk, it never finds the, the, the victim. If, if it can only go straight, when it comes somewhere it moves a little bit to go further straight then moves a little bit, go for the straight. Usually it will de deadlock in, in some of the corners of the... Of the uh, or um, y uh, you have some other, other um, algorithms and then you see in how many seconds uh, you can, uh, in average, uh, find the victim. 
or if you look at our monitoring tool, if you see our monitoring tool uh, here, uh, tools here, you can see certain values of the certain adaptation patterns, and then uh, and also showing uh, the the ensembles. Okay, you don't see here ensembles, but you see the the values of the certain parameters in the. It's like a debugging tool that you can you can use, and. Uh, once we are happy with this, we deploy uh, the system using Argos uh, uh, runtime system, which then really can put the real robots and, and run. Now, I want to uh, tell you a bit more uh, one, one aspect of the system, uh, which uh, puts you in the robot perspective. That's why the title of, of, of my talk. Uh, so we were in the exhibition uh, uh, we had an exhibition in ICT conference in Vilnius. It's a huge conference, uh, more than 5,000 people, uh, organized by European Commission, who is actually financing us. This, that's why we had to make uh, the funny demo there. Uh, and uh, we organized a competition. Uh, 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 the robot, our robot was, uh, the goal was to take some, uh, some uh, bricks and uh, move it from here to there. And th th there was one box with the robot who was doing this autonomously, and another box with the same scenario uh, was there, and uh, any anyone could uh, uh, control the robot with a joystick. And we said, okay, who is better, our autonomous system or just accidental visitor who would do it? And this is uh, that was our 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 uh, scenario. Those are the little. Uh, bricks and the, this one was the autonomic robot and this one was the one who was controlled by the, anyone who wanted to compete with us. No prizes is here. I mean, we didn't give prizes to them, but it was kind of uh, interesting and fun. Especially a lot of uh, young people are very good on joystick. And I have to tell you, I tried and I didn't stand a chance. I just, but I, I'm not very skillful with joystick. That was one of the of the of the reason. Okay, so uh, again, uh, th this is the scenario, and uh, when it happens that uh, we got some of those guys and kids who are better than our robot, then of course we get angry, and we said, "Come on, it's not fair. Uh, what you see and what you do." Is, is not really uh, fair that you can compete with our primitive robot. Because see the visual system of the robot. This is what our robot sees. And because the robot has a camera, you know, the, uh, on, 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 on the, and there is a mirror, round mirror there, and those are the elements which needs to be carried down. So this is the, the, the vision of, of the robot. And it can go left and right, of course, and it can approach this. And it can differ in the color. Uh, when it sees the, the red color, then, uh, no, sorry, the, the green color, then it knows it's a landmark. It should go this direction. Otherwise, it wouldn't know in which directions to go. So we said to those who were better than we were, now you look to the screen. You see the exactly the same as our robot sees, and then see who is better. And of course, then we were absolutely much better. So, what I want to say is that uh, uh, sometimes we take for granted that with all our senses we can do various things, and you think it's 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 easy. But basically, when you want to implement any of these functions in the in the computer, you see how complex it is, even if it is simple for us. And uh, also. Uh, uh, in autonomous systems, you know, we are autonomous, but we also, in our autonomy, we have a number of autonomous features that we are not aware of. You know, we are breathing autonomously, our heart, you know, goes autonomously. There are a number of movements which we uh, do without thinking, you know, like you said, can you take this and then I know I should go like this, you know. But it, the robot will just try to go straight. No, it will hit this. And then we, we have experience built in in our autonomy. And that's why uh, autonomy is a really fairly complex process, which actually is constructed out of very simple autonomic behaviors. And we are trying to deal with this. And uh, that's uh, why this uh, uh, subtitle uh, saying, OK, it's not that easy as it looks. 
looks and and then you you have to somehow take this into account okay so at this uh, conference uh, we were very proud because they were really huge conference and this is the 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 major uh, or the uh, Brussels version of the video of this in three minutes and we, we were two minutes they allocated to the president of, of, of the <laughs> European Commission talking about this and the rest one minute was dedicated to all the all the all the exhibitions and we were uh, half a minute there all the others were five seconds or something so we were very proud of this so th those are our, our robots doing this there okay so uh, <laughs> when you uh, further think about the practice and impacts on the on the on this kind of technology, now I put this in this cartoon uh, the ensemble building, you know, like cloud building here, and then uh, you can really use the same technology to control immobility, cloud computing, and swarm robotics. Uh, graphically showing this, but in a way. Uh, uh, what do you really want with your autonomic system? When you, do you want to deploy them? To what extent the present systems are really autonomous? And uh, how autonomous uh, we want them to be? Are you ready to give your own autonomy for the uh, autonom uh, autonomous system? Because mixing with uh, autonomous systems with our autonomy is a very tricky issue. And certainly there are situations where you will say, okay, I'll let this system do it instead of me. But I don't want to sacrifice my autonomy for any, any autonomous system, which is usually made by certain plan. Because our autonomy is really natural. It somehow came from our experience. And those kind of systems are usually often... Uh, autonomous in terms of having a certain strategy and when this strategy follows maybe some business plan maybe we will not be happy with this so uh, taking uh, uh, or using uh, autonomous system is a tricky issue now here actually uh, we want to show our robot uh, one but you know we uh, we force the competitor to 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 have a, a, a glasses actually seeing as a robot sees. So sometimes these uh, electronic glasses are actually reducing our capabilities. Think about this when you, you know, favorize even a Google Glass. You gain something, but you are losing something as well. And also, uh, this is a nice metaphor uh, showing that basically uh, we try to develop uh, to imitate the nature but we are still very far from doing this. So it's the mission impossible for us to make something which is better than our brain. That's my opinion. Because if brain were simpler, we would be even more simple to do it. So it's, it's a system of task. So uh, robots can't do it. And also, this is the way exactly how I would say give, because system of tasks is something which is you know, meaningless. We don't have to have his physical tasks, so we give it to robots. So this is the best uh, uh, recommendation. We should give to the robots tasks that we don't want to do, and then we don't mix with our autonomy. I have a second more, uh, which I just want to uh, show you something that I really wanted to talk about. Uh, but uh, then uh, I switched to... Oh, Sorry, this is... Okay, now I'll tell you just, and then because I'm, I'm just in, in trouble with this, autonomy of this system is really not in line with my autonomy. Uh, what I really want to, to tell you is more about the uh, impacts of, the, of the, this uh, new technology. And I'm, I'm doing a course on this, uh, I did one in, in Puc Rio, and I, I'm doing another one in Luca. And basically, uh, if you are interested in in the aspects of the impacts that the new technology has on us, you can contact me. It's not about privacy; privacy is, is just one aspect. But 
what is the impact that technology has on us? Because we are changing the world. We are virtualizing the physical world. It's changing our perspectives. Now, having something physically is mutated with having something, having right to use something. Or building or socializing is really melted with, uh, with you know, uh, with, with some uh, uh, socializing on the Facebook, having friends and so on, on the f virtual friends. So it's confusing for the people and uh, I do investigate all this from various points of view, from philosophical, social, psychological and technological. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Nicola. I will move to the side of the room over here, totally in the back. Please stand up. I'll hold the microphone for you. And what's, what would your question be? Okay. My question is concerning swarm behavior you described. You try to mimic, not copy, biological system because to copy it's very difficult. We don't know how they organize really. You find some simple rules for each robot. You spend lots of time for simulation. Then try to do this. But in reality, it doesn't work. For instance, you have a group of robots on a battlefield. Uh, goals are changing. Will you make simulation of new rules for each new task? It's uh, very, 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 very difficult. Very, very difficult. So, so far, so I know I know this topic very well. I know application of robotics in military. And uh, so, so far, it remains uh, games for kids in some sense. How to make it? working in reality. Any ideas? Well, uh, our, our approach is, first of all, we are not dealing with military at all. The whole European consortia are against any of the use of military. So if they use our technology, they have to copy it, you know, not from us. Yeah, sure, I understand. Uh, what we do is our system is working and uh, simulation helps. So what we try to do is to simulate elements of this and then to put it together. I agree with you, in a more complex situation, it will probably not work. But you know, you have to go step by step. And of course, as you said, we mimic the nature. Nature is perfect. We don't understand even how, how this form behavior functions, not to mention our brain. So we are, we are going in, in this direction, but th 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 this is, of course, the problem that every, every scientist in Swarm Robotics have. So, yes, you point out the real problem. Any more questions? Yes? We invite you to stand up. <laughs> First of all, uh, I want uh, to thank you for uh, your presentation. Very nice. And uh, the question is complexity of behavior you avoid complexity of behavior because you, in your uh, presentation, there are not uh, complexity. Uh, I know, in my opinion, uh, uh, the behavior is uh, uh, exponential complexity. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, this is actually, very close to the question before, uh, but uh, that's why I showed the immobility case study, where the complexity, even with the four elements that we are putting together, is much less than in a swarm robotics in terms of, of, uh, of how many. But still, you have a number of problems, and I think we are solving these problems successfully. As the complexity rises, of course, you're, you're, you're getting in trouble, but that's why we focused on the, on the so to say, a less complex problem uh, to approach complexity. We'll have time to do some more discussing later on in the break, and I invite you all, because uh, obviously we have great minds here that are into the, the topic and can really go into the depth to, uh, to create a group and talk a little bit more with each other. For now, we would like to thank you very much, and obviously, as you already expect, a level three applause for your contribution to the SAI conference. Nikolai Zerbejira.